All right, let's begin with two foundational truths as followers of Christ. One, we as God's people are led by the Holy Spirit. Two, God's people are called to follow where the Holy Spirit leads. One verse that clearly teaches this is in Romans 8.14. In Romans 8.14 where Paul writes, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Again, we are called to follow where the Holy Spirit leads. And this plays out in two arenas in life. One is the arena in which all things are objective. Two, the arena in which all things are subjective. We go, well, what, what's meant by this? Objective, that is, things which can be ascertained by hard evidence. Speaks of a person or their judgment not, not influenced by personal feelings or opinions in considering and representing facts. How about subjective? That which cannot be ascertained by hard evidence. So objective, you have hard evidence, you can find the truth. Subjective, it cannot be ascertained by hard evidence. Subjective has to do with one's feelings and opinions, which influences thought. So let, let's have a bit of fun here before we get going in our text and just have some examples, some subjective examples. What are some examples? It would be like somebody arguing that the color neon green is the best color there is. That's subjective. You could say, we could take the draft that happened this last week, somebody arguing that their team had the, the best draft. That's subjective. For maybe uh, those that are younger or maybe younger at heart, you could look at uh, comics. DC comics versus Marvel comics. Right? People have their favorite, but that's subjective. Somebody might say, well, DC is the best comics, and somebody might say Marvel is the best comics. Or maybe you could look even with cosmetic products. Somebody argue, well, Mary Kay products are better than Avon products. Or how about sports? Hockey is better than basketball. These are subjective examples. They're based on feelings, opinions, but not hard evidence. So let's think of some objective examples. Things that could be ascertained by hard evidence where you could evaluate truth. How about this? Chocolate chip cookies are the best, and oatmeal baked goods are the worst. That's actually subjective. But you see how I couldn't even bring myself to put them in the class of a cookie. They're a baked good now. They've been degraded. <laughs> so objective. Let, let's get serious now on some examples. We can look at Jim. If your truck, I don't know what, uh, how many miles of per gallon you get, but if you measured it out, if you actually kept a track of it, maybe it would be like 16.6666666 miles a gallon. That's objective truth. It's not based on his opinions of how many his uh, how many gallon, uh, miles he gets per gallon. It is ascertained by truth. I thought about Rick this week. Uh, one of his latest use had triplets. He said that's the second time ever in all his time raising them that he's had triplets. Well, how do we know that? Is that subjective or objective? Well, that's objective because we could go to his place and we could look at the mama you and count the triplets. We go, well, there's one, there's two, there's three. That's hard evidence. Objective. There's four canonical gospels in our Bibles. Right? Matthew, Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let me get the right order there. I was like, I'm missing one. That's not four. But you get the point, right? There's four. Water is better for you than Coca-Cola and Mountain Dew. Some of you might want to be hesitant about that truth. Some might want to argue. But it's true. Water is better. 
All right, so let's maneuver now to some examples of the Holy Spirit leading objectively and subjectively. Let's continue with objectively. Some objective examples. The Holy Spirit leading you to read your Bibles. We are called to read our Bibles. That's not a, a matter of opinion of how one feels. To memorize Scripture, that's definitely objective because normally we don't like to memorize Scripture, but we are called in His Word to memorize. To pray, to give, to serve, to share the gospel. These are examples that are clearly outlined in God's Word of things we are called to do. But now let's shift to the subjective. The Holy Spirit leading you to keep or change your job. You're not going to find that in the Bible. <coughs> You're going to have to evaluate and discern for yourself if God is calling you to stay at your job or leave your job. To keep your house or sell your house. Last I knew, that's not in Genesis or Exodus or Numbers or Leviticus or Deuteronomy. Sharing the gospel. Again, that is objective. We are all to share the gospel. But what if you're in Walmart and, and you go, okay, here's an individual over there and there's an individual over there. I kind of know them both. But you have to pick, well, am I going to go engage in conversation over here or there? That's subjective. The, the Bible doesn't say you need to share the gospel with the person on your right and not on your left. How about teaching the children of the church or the teens of the church, right? Maybe you, you feel called that you are to help teach, but having to discern, well, well, should I be with children? Should I be with teens? Should I be in the nursery? Whatever the case may be, that's subjective. Think of it this way. Objective is that which is black and white. <coughs> and subjective is more gray. Objective is navigating in the, the clear-cut parameters. And subjective is navigating more like in a, the midst of a dense fog. Now, our time today will be focusing upon the subjective rather than the objective. And one quick preliminary disclaimer, the Holy Spirit will never lead you contrary to his written word. Amen? Amen. Th this is his revealed will for your life. It is objective truth, and he'll never guide you otherwise. Uh, uh, otherwise. But it, it's interesting as we uh, talk to individuals uh, at work or sometimes even in church, They'll, they'll be claiming that they're following the Holy Spirit, and yet what they're doing is contradicting His very Word. We have to be clear. The Baptist Catechism puts it this way. What well, things are chiefly contained in the Holy Scriptures? The Holy Scriptures chiefly contain what man ought to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. So the Holy Scripture speaks to what we need to know about God but also what he requires of us. And so if what we find in here is what we are to do, and somebody says, well, I, I, the Holy Spirit is leading me to go over here, away from this, well, we know that's not accurate. It might be led by a spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit. Once more, we are called to follow where the Holy Spirit leads. And as any Christian worth their salt knows, it is easier said than done. Amen? Why is that? Because there are challenges involved in following the Holy Spirit. In fact, our Texas study presents three challenges in following the Holy Spirit. So now let's turn our attention to our text and see if we're familiar with these three challenges. I invite you at this time to please join me in your Bibles as we read verses 6 through 8. Acts 16, verses 6 through 8. They passed through the Thergian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mycenae, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mycenae, they came down to Troas. Are you familiar 
with the challenge of following the Holy Spirit contained in this portion of our text. Following the Holy Spirit is challenging because he closes some doors. He closes some doors. They here are forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word and that haven't been forbidden. That's really just one word in the original Greek, and it means to forbid, to hinder, to keep from, to withhold a thing from anyone, or to deny a thing. So when maybe you take your kids to Brahms for dinner and they want ice cream and you, you know, do not let them you uh, forbid them to have ice cream. You play the role of a bad guy there in that instance. But that's what the Holy Spirit is doing here. No, you, you cannot do this. You cannot have this. Again, think about that. Who is the one hindering from this work of ministry? It's the Holy Spirit. And that seems a bit odd that the Holy Spirit would prevent something uh, that clearly would be acceptable and good. He's preventing them to speak the word. Again, that's a good thing to share the gospel, to say something biblical, something that, that lifts up the name of the Lord. This is the thing we're called to do, and yet they're forbidden in this circumstance. We move on. They're trying to go to Bithynia, and here is the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. The Spirit of Jesus, we could ask, well, who is that exactly? That's clearly the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus, and He is God. So we see that these verses point to the, the Trinitarian truth. Uh, keep your place in Acts, but I do want you to look at 2 Corinthians. So this is just barely to the right. We'll bypass Romans. We can do that. Bill's not here with us today. So. 2 Corinthians... Go to the very last chapter, first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. We read here, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, Let me pause, I still hear pages. Second Corinthians 13. Verse 14. It's the very end of 2 Corinthians. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's a person, and the love of God, that's the second person here, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, that's the third, be with you all. Our God is a Trinitarian God. One God existing in three persons. And now that I've made that point, go back to Acts, Acts 16. So we pick up with the Spirit of Jesus, and here it says, did not permit. And the permit is to allow, uh, to allow one to do as he wishes, to, not, uh, to, re uh, to restrain, uh, to let alone, and here it's in the negative, so they're not allowing this to happen. And, and so basically what we see happening in our text at this point is Luke is using two different ways to communicate one truth. Two different Greek words, but he's trying to get to the, the point across that, that God is not allowing them to go in this region and minister the word. R.C. Sproul says this about what's happening. He says, as they travel, we read that the Holy Spirit directed their journey, prohibiting them from entering certain regions. He says, from that we learn that one of the way God leads his people is by closing doors. History is full of examples of this. Your lives are probably too. But I think of the great uh, missionary, David Livingston. He wanted to go to China, but he was redirected and sent to Africa. William Carey, he wanted to go to Polynesia, but he was sent to India. I, I think of uh, churches today in our own time having an Awanas program or wanting to have an Awanas program. If you're not familiar with what Awana is, it's one of the premier children's ministries in our day. 
But there are churches that have had an Awanas program, and then for some reason, after five years, ten years, or more of a faithful ministry, that door was closed and it shut. We've, we've had that happen in our own community. One of the largest churches in our own community, they had a, a great Awanas program for well over a decade, but here in the last few years, they had to close those doors. There's some churches similar to us. We talked, I don't know if you, some of you guys remember this, four or five years ago, maybe four years ago, we were wanting to develop an Awana program, but it couldn't get off the ground. That door was closed before we even got there, right? It's just God closes some doors. So the question I want to consider now is why is the Holy Spirit closing a door challenging? <coughs> A couple of reasons I can think of. One, it can go against human wisdom. God closing a door in our lives can go against our wisdom. The ESV study Bible says this, Natural human wisdom would have led them to think that they should preach the gospel in all the cities that they pass through. Speaking of Paul and his companions. But it says, but instead, the Holy Spirit directed them on a 400-mile journey by foot to Troas. See, so in their human wisdom, they think, well, it makes sense as we're traveling along. We'll go to all these cities and share the gospel. But the Holy Spirit closes that door against that human wisdom. And sometimes it's hard for us to fathom. Well, God, wouldn't it make more sense if you let somebody else do this? Or, or maybe wouldn't it make more sense if we did it? this way or whatever the case may be and God closes the door. No, you're going to do this a different way or a different person will do it all together. Secondly, it can be challenging because it can hurt. A closed door can hurt due to our commitment of time and emotion. It can be discouraging. It can be the catalyst which we respond in passivity and indifference. So, so we think about this way. If we've been ministering in some capacity, in some ministry for maybe a year, maybe five years, maybe multiple decades, and yet God, for whatever reason, decides to close that door, it can hurt. But I put in years of service. I've sacrificed time and energy and talents for this particular thing. I don't understand why he's closing this door. And you probably know individuals that have had this happen. Maybe you've been there in your own life where when a door closes, they then hobble over to the sideline and they stay on the sideline for years. Because that closed door hurt, and they're not willing to get back in and look for a different door. It hurts when we've been invested in something, and the door's closed. It's, it's kind of like having the door of your car slammed against your fingers, and that, that just hurts so bad. Warren Wiersbe says this. He says, we can well imagine that Paul was disappointed and perhaps a bit discouraged. Everything had been going so smoothly on his, this second journey that they, these closed doors must have come as a great surprise. And then he continues here, and I love this part. However, it is comforting to know that even the apostles were not always clear as to God's will for their ministry. Who wants to raise their hand saying, man, I wish God made it more clear in the direction for my life. Amen. For my family's life. But we see even here, the apostles themselves were not clear. Sometimes the Holy Spirit closes some doors and we need to be okay with it and not let it sideline us. Paul and his companions could have just went back to Antioch. They could have stumbled back to Jerusalem. Going, you know what? That didn't work out, so we're just not going to do anything. But as we see in our text, that's not what happened. This is to say 
this particular challenge, when God shuts doors in our lives, this should, this should prohibit all pity parties. I don't know about you, but I throw great pity parties. Just ask my wife. Maybe you've never had the luxury of coming to one of my pity parties, but they do exist. <laughs> but this tells us that we should not have those. I want to ask, has God closed some doors in your past that you need to heal from? That you need to recover from? Maybe God is currently closing a door before you that you need to stop fighting, that you need to stop resisting. Following the Holy Spirit is challenging because he closes some doors. What's another challenge of, challenge of following the Holy Spirit? Well, let's continue in our text. So if you would, please join me in your Bibles as we read verse 9. Acts 16, verse 9. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Are, are you, I wonder, familiar with the challenge contained in this part of our scripture in following the Holy Spirit? Here we see that following the Holy Spirit can be challenging because he opens some doors. So he closes some doors, he opens some doors. So here our text of study today it begins again with God closing a door, but now we see he's opening a door. Paul has this vision, there's this man, and in it he appeals to him, and this appealing is it, a very colorful, vivid word, meaning to beseech or exhort or desire or entreat. Basically, it has a picture of, of somebody begging. And what is this man begging? What is he appealing to? He says, come over here. You're over there. You're trying to minister. It's not working. Come over here. And he says, and help us. We need aid. We need help. So first, Paul and his band of brothers experience a door being basically, again, it's just slammed in their face. And now they experience a door being blown wide open. A nice Kansas wind has come and opened up the door. Here's the question. What's now challenging about following the Holy Spirit when he opens the door? I, I think it makes more sense that the challenge comes when God closes the door. We just go, yeah, I understand that. Because it does hurt when we have a desire to do something and God tells us no. Right? We have children, <laughs> grandchildren perhaps. Do they like it when you tell them no? No. When I'm in Lowe's and I find this uh, tool that I really want and I tell my wife, I appeal to her, I need this. She says, no, I don't like it. But here, as it comes to God opening a door, we could say, well, what's challenging about that? The challenge is we find ourselves contending with the shut door rather than going to the open door. This is to say we are so stuck on the closed door that we fail to see the open door. Where we have our sheep at our house, we have this kind of middle pasture. And there's a north gate and a south gate. I can open up, up and the sheep will go in one direction that I want them to go. But if I, let's say, open up that north gate, they grow accustomed to going out that gate. It becomes normal. It becomes this habit forming. Then they just, they, I can just open that gate and they just make for it. They run as fast as they can and get over to the, the greener grass. But then there's time that I have to rotate them. They graze over there plenty. There could be almost sometimes no grass left. So I have to close that door and I open up the other gate on the south side. Where's the first place they go? They go to that north gate, and they're fighting, and they're crying. <laughs> they, they want to get in there. That's their normal procedure of their life. That's their habit. 
They're fighting, let me through this gate while there's an open gate over there to greener pastures. We are very similar in this regard. Now, I'm used to this. I, I don't care if there's a shut door in front of me. I'm going to cry. I'm going to contend. Whatever the case may be. And we fail to see the open gate. The open possibility. The new possibilities. The Lord is saying, come and partake. We saw this, I think, a bit in our children's and teens program coming back from COVID. Uh, prior to COVID, we always had a Wednesday night, uh, robust ministry, children's ministry, teen ministry. But when we came back, it was dismal. It, it, it was just very quiet and silent and, and really a, a sense of uh, being among the dead in that regard. And we talked for months of what to do and there was talk, well, maybe a, a different time, a different day, a different whatever the case may be. And we always came back to, well, let's continue for Wednesday nights, continue Wednesday nights. And we did that for some time. And I think there's a good wisdom in that, not to adjust too quickly. But we finally said, well, maybe there's an open door somewhere else. Right? Maybe Wednesday nights is closed, but maybe there's been a door made wide open on a different night, a Sunday night. And since then, our children's ministry has been flourishing more and more. It's natural. We've seen these things happen in our own congregation. We've seen it happen in our own lives. See, the challenge with open doors is that normally they're new doors. And it requires a sense of humility. Of, Lord, you know better than me. Because right? our tendency is we've always done things this way, and so this is the way we should do it, but acknowledging, okay, Lord, you're the boss. You're the king of my life, of the church, and I will bend my will. I will uh, bend my will. I will bend my uh, preferences and desires. The challenge comes with our willingness and ability to adapt and to change. It's been said that nobody likes change, but change is always the constant in our lives. Things always change, but yet we resist it. What we see throughout Scripture, what we see throughout church history, what you know of your very lives is that God loves to open doors. He loves to open new doors for us to walk through. Ask, are you looking for open doors? Or are you just so, again, prone to, to want to contend for that closed door that you fail to see that open door? Following the Holy Spirit is challenging because He closes some doors, He opens some doors. What's another challenge? Well, let's conclude our text. I invite you to please join me in your Bibles one last time as we read verses. 10 through 13. Acts chapter 16, verses 10 through 13. When he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and on the day following to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia. A Roman colony, and we were staying in this city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer, and we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. Are you familiar with the challenge contained in this portion of our text? Following the Holy Spirit is challenging because He does not push us through doors. Paul, we see here, and the others have been prohibited from ministering in one place. Now they've been invited. There's an open invitation to come and minister in another place. But what happens next? 
Does the Holy Spirit magically teleport the missionary team to Macedonia? You say, God, okay, beam us up. Send us over there. Does the Holy Spirit make the decision for these men? No. The door is open for them to walk through, but God, he, again, he does not push them through. I kind of grew up around the water. I love the water. And when I was growing up, when I was younger, me and my cousins, we'd all meet at the lake, uncles and aunts, grandparents. And when we were small, you know, the, the water was, we were timid of it. Didn't know what to think, right? We didn't know how to swim yet. But there was a, a sense in which some of our dads, right or wrong, to get us accustomed, they just kind of threw us in. I don't know if that was your experience, but that was mine. Right? There was a dock, just get in there. God doesn't do that. Right? He's a loving father. See, again, he doesn't push us through. That's precisely what we see in our text. Paul and the others have this open door of ministry, and what do they do? They make the decision to immediately go. And they ran a straight course. And that's how we need to respond to open doors. Not, well, let me think more about it, pray more about it. And yes, we do need to think, and yes, we do need to pray, but sometimes we can use that as an excuse to sit on our behinds. Well, how long are you going to pray about it? Well, I don't know. It's only been two years. <laughs> They get there. They don't waste any time. They find a group of people to minister to. They come across a women's, essentially, prayer group. And they began speaking to them. Now, I want to say a little bit about Paul here and, and teaching the women. Um, he, he has a, a bad time with feminist groups today. Uh, and, and so I want to open this up, and we'll look at it more next week, of course, as, as there's this dialogue that's taking place there. But I want to lean for this time on John MacArthur, as he says, it is significant that the first people Paul preached to in Europe were women. I don't know if you knew that. He goes on to say, Paul is often presented as a male chauvinist by those who reject his teaching on the role of women. Meaning the role of women, of course, in the house, in the church. <coughs> MacArthur continues, but he was not prejudiced. As his eagerness to speak with this group shows. He says Paul's attitude was in sharp contrast to that of the fellow Pharisees. They would not stoop to teach a woman. And they regularly, in their rote prayers, they thanked God that they were neither Gentiles, slaves, nor women. Think about that. These are men who are called to be Teachers of the word of God, teachers of the law, and yet they look down upon females to the point that they say, thank God that I'm not a woman. It's sad, really. So this is the, the religious environment that Paul came from. <clears throat> Further, the Greco-Roman world, the... the Society, it ran counter to the treatment of women. It was not good by any regards or any standard. Really, it was Christianity that, that helped make headway for women. It's clear through the recordings of Paul's ministry that he valued women and truly believed that in Christ there is neither male nor female. That's in Galatians. Rabbis would even say this. It is better that the words of the law be burned than be delivered to a woman. <coughs> that is male chauvinism. But this was not Paul's attitude. In, in 1 Timothy 2, in fact, Paul rails against society norms, again, religious and not, and he says, let the women Learn. Paul was all for teaching women. 
He would never say we need men's Bible studies, but not women's Bible study. Now, Paul, and, and what we'll see here, as especially we go into next week, Paul was about giving the women a, a deep, robust lesson. It wasn't when life gives you lemons, let's make lemonade. No, he, he, he's going to be delving into Christology and theology and pneumatology. He's going to let them drink of the deep wells of the great theological truths. We need women's ministries like that today. Because so much is in our time. When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Again, it's challenging. God opens doors. He doesn't push us through. Let's think through that as we come to a close. We see this as Paul would later send Timothy to Ephesus to pastor there. But Timothy had to choose to go. Later, Paul would send Titus to Crete and set in order that which remains and appoint elders in every city. But Titus had to decide to do that. We go to the days of the Reformation. I don't know if you know who these two men are. You might think, well, those look like the same guy almost. And I would say, yeah, they do look closely uh, similar. This guy on the right is none other, none other than the great reformer John Calvin. John Calvin, at this time, he left uh, his home because of the persecution. He's heard that there's been a reprieve. There's no more persecution for a time. So he, he travels back uh, to pick up some relatives. And then he, he wants to go back to Strasbourg, which at this time is in uh, Germany. And so he's on his way, he wants to go to Strasbourg, and there he is intent, he feels like, hey, I just want to spend time in books, reading, and writing. That's what I want to do with my life. He was a young, up-and-coming theologian, and that was his plan for his life. Well, he's making his way to Strasbourg, and because of circumstances the road is closed due to the army and so he has a detour and he goes to Geneva and in Geneva he's in this open tavern eating a meal writing and then the one of the key leaders of this new reformed city down on the left, William Farrell, sees him. And doing what any good person would do on a, a search committee, a pulpit committee, that their church is in need of, a, a, a good pastor. He goes, I think that's John Calvin. I think that's the, the great up and coming star in the Reformation. Well, we need him at our church. It's kind of like saying, hey, we need Bodie Bauckham to come and preach at. Our church. So Will, William Farrell, he sees John Calvin, he walks over there and he says, hey, basically, he says, you know, we're looking for a pastor. Why don't you come be our pastor? Again, John Calvin, that's the last thing he wants to do. Yeah, I just want to be left alone. I want to go find a closet, shut the door, read and write. So he says, I don't want to be bothered by people. He says, now I'm going to pass. William Farrell, he was fiery, and try to compel him more and more. God, no, I, I just, I don't think that's, that's the door that God's opening for me. The woman Farrell says, if you do not come be our pastor, then God curse you. So at that point, John Calvin replied, okay, I'll come. And he served in Geneva for years and of course, he was removed for a few years, but then he came back and ministered the rest of his time there at that church. There's a door that was open in Geneva. There was an invitation, but John Calvin had to make the decision. God wasn't just going to teleport him there and push him through that door. Again, following the Holy Spirit is challenging because he does not push us through. Now, does this suggest that the Holy Spirit does not place upon us 
any pressure to walk through. For those of us who've been walking with the Lord for any length of time, we know this is not the case. We could say the Holy Spirit is a meddler. You know, it's interesting, in the Holy Scriptures, he's called the Comforter, the Helper. But Jesus didn't tell his disciples that he was going to be a meddler in your life. It's precisely why he is. The Holy Spirit will prod us, poke us, but he'll never push us through. The Holy Spirit works in conjunction with our will, not circumventing our will. Right? He, he's not going to make us do something in that sense. What are some examples of this that he might use to, again, prod and poke metal with our lives? Maybe it's a church leader coming up to you and going, hey, you know, have, have you ever thought about doing this? Can you pray about this? Maybe it's a friend knowing you and you're talking through about life. And a friend says, you know what you should be doing in light of this? You should start this, or you should help volunteer in this. Maybe it's a child saying to their dad, you know, I hear Pastor Kyle saying that the church is going to start training some men to be elders. And the child look at their dad, when are you going to man up? Now, I don't want to let the women, the moms off, so I got something for you, too. I'm not a chauvinist. The child saying to their mom, you know, I, I hear that the church needs help with dot, dot, dot. Or, or you know, mom, sometimes I, I hear you complain about this going on. But then the child says, you know, mom, have you ever considered that the Lord might be wanting you to help with dot, dot, dot. He will not push us through. Following the Holy Spirit is challenging. And ask, what doors are open before you that God is waiting on you to walk through? And it may be something at your workplace. It could be something regarding your family at home. I, I, I don't know. I'm not the Holy Spirit. Again, with this open door, God could push you through, but he won't. He makes you take that step of faith in saying, Lord, I don't really know about this, but I'm confident that you know about this. Your brothers and sisters, do not wait for the Lord to push you through some door. He has already ordained that door. He's already opened that door. He's already custom fit that door for you and your life and your giftedness and your talents. The only thing that he asks you to do is walk through. Well, our text today is descriptive and not prescriptive. We can still draw from it some safe and helpful points for how to perceive and to follow the Holy Spirit. When it comes to following God's guidance, again, we always begin with God's clear revealed will in our Bibles. But then we must remain sensitive to the Spirit's prompting. We should seek godly counsel when we're not certain. To think over situations carefully before making a decision. Also, please do not grow discouraged along the way when doors are closed. Again, sometimes doors close, sometimes they open. The Christian's life goal is to be faithful wherever the Lord leads and to maintain a humble and open heart along the journey. Remember this, as long as God is with us, we have reason to rejoice whether we're in a season of perplexity and wandering or in a season of certainty and fulfillment. That's kind of really the two seasons that we walk through as believers, is it not? A season where times are perplexing and we're wandering. We feel like we don't really know what we're doing or where we are going. 
But then there's other seasons of certainty and fulfillment. And we've got to be trusting in both of those seasons. Because the Christian life is not always about certainty and fulfillment. Sometimes we are wandering. One last note about discerning God's will for your lives. Uh, I would recommend, Bodie Bauckham has a great sermon, Discerning God's Will. Uh, it's a five-step process. He says, first, read your Bibles. That's step number one. Step number two, think biblically. Three, pray biblically. Four, seek godly counsel from those who read their Bibles, think uh, biblically, and pray biblically. And then fifth, when in doubt, repeat. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, there is a challenge that comes with following the Holy Spirit. Indeed, we truly believe that that he does lead us as your people, as your children. But Lord, when it comes to some certain things in our lives, in the realm of subjection, sometimes it's hard to know what to do. And Lord, I want to pray for your saints here this morning that are experiencing or have experienced some closed doors, some doors shut up on their faces, and they're struggling with, maybe they need help healing from, Lord, I just pray that you help heal them from these. Lord, I pray that as your saints have experienced possible, uh, possibilities of open doors, Lord, I pray that you give us eyes to see that we'd stop contending with the shut doors. And Lord, these open doors could come in many varieties, coming through the gift of salvation, an open door, you calling someone to believe in the glorious gospel, to repent of their sins, trust in Christ as their Savior. It could be an open door of ministry in the church. It could be an open door regarding home life, or work. It could be in millions of things. But Lord, I pray that you would help my dear brothers and sisters here know what you would want them to do. That you'd give them the courage to take that step of faith and walk through. Knowing you will not push us. It, it would be so much easier if you just pushed us through. But Lord, help us be sensitive and help us to acknowledge and to see and hear and feel those promptings, those proddings by the Spirit that comes through various means. In Christ's name we pray.